This is a companion video to our treatment of the median voter and one-dimensional politics. Here we're going to look at agenda setting in a context of multi-dimensional politics. The key issue, as before, is to have a better understanding of how democracy works in practice. Just to recap, there's a fair amount of economic evidence that democracy offers better policy outcomes than the alternative, but still, relative to a lot of observers, economists tend in some ways to be more skeptical or more cynical about the actual operation of democracy. Just to recap, here's the median voter model, where political opinion can be simply arrayed on one line, something like from left to right, and people at various points on the left wing or the right wing side of the spectrum, they basically agree with each other about all the different issues. In contrast, we're going to look at cases where having everyone politically lined up on a single dimension isn't the case. So what does multidimensional politics mean? Well, let's consider some specific examples. For instance, you have multidimensional politics when people who agree on domestic policy do not in general have the same sets of opinions on foreign policy. Alternatively, you could imagine that people who agree on domestic policy don't agree on policy toward religion, and most generally, if you stipulate that they don't agree on everything, what you have are a number of different directions in which political opinion splits. If you'll recall, in the single-dimensional model, if an individual, say, stakes out a right-wing stance on domestic policy, that means they have a right-wing stance on foreign policy, on social policy, and on all the other issues. There's one line along which everyone stands, but here we're saying that people don't always agree with each other on all the different issues. Another concrete example that can give rise to multidimensional politics is when you have people who prefer the extremes to the center position. For instance, in the case of foreign policy, an individual might favor an all-out war with some other country, or they might favor no war at all, but they might be skeptical about a limited intervention. That would be an example of preferring either extreme to the position in the center. When multidimensional politics are present, often the person called the agenda setter has considerable political power. Let's work through a simple example. There's person one, and that person has the preferences A preferred to B and B preferred to C. Person two prefers C to A and A to B. Person three prefers B to C and also C to A. If you think carefully about it, that is indeed a multidimensional example. A more traditional, unidimensional, more partisan example would be if you had person one preferring A to B to C, and then you had some other person on exactly the opposite side of the political spectrum preferring C to B to A, and those would be exactly the opposite preferences of person one. You could think of, say, person one is the left winger, and this other person here is the right winger, wanting exactly the opposite things, but that's not the way we've spelt out the preferences in this example. Let's go back to those same multidimensional preferences we just wrote down and imagine how an agenda setter might take on a significant degree of power. For instance, let's say that the agenda setter has the power to say, of these three options, we're only going to vote on two of them. That is, I won't let one of the third options even get to the floor of Congress or Parliament. Let's say that agenda setter had a personal preference in favor of A. What that agenda setter would do then is simply rule out the option of C, and with C ruled out, you have a vote of A against B, and A would win. Or let's say the agenda setter has a personal favorite of option B. The option that would then be ruled out by that agenda setter, the agenda setter would think, ah, I should rule out option A. And when we then vote B against C, you can see that B beats C 2 to 1, and B would win. Or alternatively, say the agenda setter has as a personal favorite option C, the agenda setter could then say, hmm, what I really need to do is rule out option B, and when I rule out option B, we're just voting C against A, and C beats A 2 to 1. This is a very simple example, but what it shows is that the person who has the power to decide what gets voted on actually can control everything. Whether your personal favorite would be A, B, or C, if you can rule out one of the options to not even come up for a vote, you will get exactly your personal option. 
and it may look democratic. You'll see people voting A against B or B against C or C against A. There'll be a vote. The majority favored option will win. But when you peer more deeply behind the surface, what this voting model shows you is that the agenda setter can, in this case, have really an extreme degree of power. There's another way you can do this exercise, and that is rather than assuming the agenda setter can completely rule out one of the options, you could change that assumption and say the agenda setter simply has the power to decide the order in which we do pairwise voting of one option against another. So the agenda setter could say, first we consider A against B, and then we consider the winner of that against C, or first we consider B against C, and then we consider the winner of that comparison against A, and so on, and I leave this as an exercise to the student, but under this assumption also you get the result that the agenda setter, by manipulating the process and doing the order of votes in the way in which he or she f cleverly figures out will lead to the desired result of the agenda setter, you again can get a process which appears entirely democratic, but is actually just reflecting the preferences of that agenda setter. One final point, if there's some option which everyone really hates, that's contrary to the preferences as written down here, but say everyone hates option D, in that case even the power of an agenda setter will not manage to get option D enacted into policy. In this sense there are limits on the power of agenda setting. It cannot put into democratic force a choice or candidate or policy, which really no one wants very much at all. This is a highly simplified model, and no one is pretending it captures all of the intricacies of real-world democratic processes. But it's just a simple way of seeing that, at least in the multidimensional case, a process which appears democratic may actually be manipulated. It may be reflecting the preferences of elites or insiders or politicians or people who are manipulating the agenda. There's a large literature on this topic, and some places you might start Wikipedia has a number of good entries, such as Condorcet Method and Transitivity, Voting Paradox, and Voting Theory. On Voting Theory in particular, it gives a list of all the other articles of relevance to this topic. If you want a more technical piece, there's one by Zarkarov called Spatial Voting Theory. It has a lot more mathematics, and a very good book on this topic is Dennis Mueller's Public Choice 3.